bringing death and despair into every community. Leaving police departments overwhelmed. They were shooting the whole time at the trooper. Meet an elite law enforcement unit that has the skills, the muscle, and the mandate to fight back. Connecticut's Emergency Services Unit, the ESU. right now, Russell. David, I think I'm driving to Portland. I couldn't see it in my head, though. Being a member of the Emergency Services Unit means always being in demand, tackling jobs ordinary state troopers are untrained to handle, recovering sunken evidence, defusing bombs. K is notifying us the emergency services unit's tactical team has been requested to respond to an armed robbery with shots being fired in the Troop K area. A couple of the guys at this dive location should be involved in that call. One's a tactical team member. Sergeant Russell Stevens, like most members of this group, is a renaissance cop. He's a patrol officer, a diver, and a specialist in the tactical or SWAT assault team. Today, the tag team responds to a drug deal gone bad. Connecticut's jails are filled with dealers and addicts. As Stevens races to the scene, he learns that the local police are taking fire. We got a page of two suspects uh, that were involved in an armed robbery, and that's all we got at that time. Uh, we got out of the water, we jumped in the car, and we drove. I mean, it was New Haven to Columbia was, that was a good hike. It, was, it probably took us around 35 minutes at an accelerated rate where it would have taken us for like an hour and 15 at a, at a normal speed. Every minute counts. Stevens changes into his tactical gear. Nobody West Team co-leader, Trooper First Class Dave Bland, briefs the unit. Make sure there's nobody in there, none of the residents or anybody else. The uh, Columbia tactical call started as a, uh, a drug deal that went bad between dealers. Uh, you had one who was going to try and sell drugs to another but didn't want to pay for it, who uh, produced a handgun and was robbing one from the other. They bailed out of the car in the cornfield. They ran out shooting. Uh, we we're kind of lucky we had the airplane in the area. He didn't see anybody going into the house. What we did is we assumed that somebody may have went to the house, and we called him out on the PA, and he ended up coming out to us. He had a phone in his hand, we walked around the telephone, talking to his attorney, while we take him into custody. He stated several times that he wished he had shot it out with the police. He didn't really have too much reason to live, and that uh, him and his partner had at one time uh, actually made a pact that uh, if they had been uh, chased by the police or caught that wasn't their intention to uh, be taken alive. Bland believes one gunman remains inside the house. The tactical team forms a stack and makes its entry. The house is empty. The gunman, gone. Making an entry into a house can prove fatal for tag team members. To maximize their strike power, they utilize a formation known as a stack. What we refer to as a stack is the way the team forms prior to making an entry or a movement. A stack can vary from two team members to the, the entire team of 12. 
Entry into the house in Columbia was made from the garage area of the residence. That offered us the most cover available. One gunman is in custody, the second still out there. Sergeant Ricky Stevens commands the East Team. His intuition tells him that the second gunman has not gone far and is likely hiding in the cornfields behind the house. Are there any questions before we get started? I assessed all the information I had at the scene. I was provided with information that uh, as big as the area was, we still had time to not only get the airplane up in the air, which held the suspect, uh, I believe, bedded down, but uniform personnel did an excellent job of providing a perimeter. So we had the roadside covered, the back of the cornfield covered, and the only thing we had to do then was basically try to locate the second subject. Yeah, I tell you guys what's going on? Land sets the search in motion. Okay, what's going to happen now is uh, the Eastern Tactical Team go to the vehicle with the Bloodhounds, cast off of that, and begin the search. Okay, they'll have the airplane assisting them, following them. The West Team will gather up here, and we'll either relieve them, or if there's a sighting, we can circle around and get to them. Hunting Club. Patrol. Patrol. That uh, has a pigeon okay. tower here. Yeah. The East Team establishes up a perimeter around the edge of the cornfield which provides perfect cover for their suspect, making the team vulnerable to an ambush. They begin their sweep. It's probably one of the most difficult searches that I've ever done, because you couldn't see. You couldn't see your feet. Um, the corn was you know, more than five or six foot tall. The leaves all branched out. You had no visibility. And it was just dangerous and slow going. Trooper Dan McCarthy is an ex-airborne ranger. He's faced a lot of tough terrain, but this is a new challenge. Going through the cornfield is uh, something I've never done before. I mean, I've been through sawgrass and stuff like that. In Panama, which is a thick, the visibility when you're traveling through corn like that is nilch, zero. You have no visibility whatsoever. Master Sergeant Danny Lewis sets up his command post at the house. Lewis, the ranking authority on the scene, coordinates the team's efforts. Roger, he, he's going towards the left, Roger. An ESU pilot radios Lewis. He spotted a hunting tower in the adjacent woods, a likely hideout. Is that w just west of the vehicle? Yes, it's about, uh, let's say, 150 yards west of the vehicle. You, your guys are approaching it now. I can see it. I haven't seen any movement on it. The duck blind is in the center. Could be in there. Just, Albert Stevens, come down to the corner and hold up right at the corner. Sergeant Ricky Stevens' team is sent out to investigate. Now, Russell Stevens takes the point. He spots the tower and signals the men. They take a position. Covered by the team, Trooper McCarthy goes in. Sergeant Stevens gave me the order to climb the tower and make sure the tower is clear. Uh, a lot goes through your mind at that point. Here I am going up a tower. My hands have to hang on to the tower to climb it, so I have no gun in my hand. Could he get the first shot at me? Yes. Um, you, you start thinking about everything, so I rely a lot on the people on the ground. I know I have the best shots we have in the state police. I was watching. If I felt there was any danger of someone peeking out and getting a shot at me before they got him, I wouldn't have even climbed it. But I work with these guys. I know these guys. I felt safe. No luck. Experience tells Stevens to double back. I just felt in my heart that with the personnel that arrived, the perimeter that they set up, and the time frame with everything, that he couldn't have gotten out without somebody have seen him. As reinforcements arrive, Lewis briefs them. 
came out here, they bailed out to the cornfield. Started. They were shooting the whole time at the troopers. Anytime somebody got alongside them, they were pegging shots. They shot at the guys here. And, uh, Our guys? They, oh, yeah. Shot at the troopers. And we pulled up. One of the guys was in the woods, circled around, broke into this house. Uh, they saw him in the house and uh, ordered him out. And uh, basically, he surrendered, came out with a flip phone talking to his attorney. So Dave and I grabbed him. He's, he's given up the name of the other guy's name is blackmail, shade, like a shaved head. Led by Bland, the West team moves in. Billy still have to start with the same thing as before. We're going to wind up here. I, I don't Ricky Stevens increases the East team's capabilities with the addition of a powerful weapon, search dogs. <laughs> One of the canine's primary responsibilities is tracking human beings. He does that in two ways. One is with a scent article, such as a vehicle or an item of clothing, and the other is to cast. When you cast, you're asking the canine to go from an area where the suspect was last known to be and to track the suspect to his present location. The air blisters with summer heat. The tension as thick as the tall growth. Stevens lays out the game plan. Push back this way, and, and then back and forth, and so on. I want to start clearing that now, rather than wait for the West team to catch up to us. Um, anybody got any questions? Not, not getting far ahead of us. The, the pace I want to be slow, even slower than before. Four hours of searching, and still no suspect. With temperatures exceeding 100 degrees, Stevens and his men have no choice but to push through the fields again. Trooper First Class Tim O'Hanley. We train for a lot of situations. I don't think we've ever trained actually walking through a cornfield. It sounds very simple. You're walking, looking for a person walking through a cornfield. The leaves were in your face. They were actually sharp. You couldn't see each other standing right next to each other. It was so thick. He could have taken out half the team. Take a breather. The team is hot and tired. Frustration mounts. And everybody's back on channel 1-8, correct? The East team lays a trap, hiding at the edge of the cornfield, half a mile north. The West team tries to drive the gunman towards them. Steve is a bland. You gonna let me know when you start? Stevens orders them back into the fields. Chunks. They've got him. The suspect buried himself in one of the cornrows. He was totally covered in mud. The only thing sticking out was a little piece of his jeans. Lenny stepped on top of him. That's how we found him. We thought we had a dead body in him. I thought at first I had a decomposed body, and then I pushed a little dirt around and saw a wedding ring. And then uh, we realized we had something there. And as we uncovered it, it was a black male. He remained perfectly motionless. He might as well have been a corpse. I mean, he was playing the part so perfectly. And I guess he was figuring that if we could walk by him, he could get past us. Six hours after the search began, the ESU tactical team has their suspect. Stevens called it right again. Patience and persistence have won the day. I just didn't see how he could have gotten out. They had a real good perimeter set up for us. We had the, heli uh, the uh, airplane up in the air relatively quickly. Uniform personnel had all, all the points uh, cordoned off. I just uh, didn't feel right about leaving the corner. The team can finally let their guard down and relax. West team co-leader, Dave Bland. 
So when you get these guys and, uh, you, and you take them into custody, you feel pretty elated about what you're doing. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, it was hot that day. It was pretty humid out there. The guys are uh, humping through the cornfields and in through the woods looking for them. So uh, it was a nice mission accomplished to, to take these two into custody. Another day, another battle won. But the war is far from over. Trooper Dan McCarthy is a member of the ESU's tactical team. Daily patrol takes him to the small town of Tarland. Even here, drugs take their toll. Got a report of a lot of syringes uh, on the road here, and there are quite a few of them. And the biggest thing, boy, you gotta keep them off the streets for the children. You know, these kids throw their bike up and down the streets here. They pick them up. They don't know what they are. They get stuck with it. Who knows what can happen to them. With HIV and everything else today. McCarthy and his fellow state troopers fight to rid their community of drugs. first observed uh, during a motor vehicle violation pulling into the parking lot at a high rate of speed. So that's the main reason we went up to the vehicle. When we approached the vehicle, there was a slight odor of uh, marijuana that we smelled. The troopers bring the same intensity to teenagers with bags of narcotics as they do to armed disabled. Because I'm going to shake the whole vehicle down anyway. Be honest with me, just tell me what you got. I asked the operator for his license and registration and asked him if he knew why I stopped him, which he did. He realized that he came into the parking lot at a high rate of speed, and he was driving a little recklessly. I uh, pointed to a convenience store. I asked him then if he had any marijuana on him, which um, he stated no at the first time. He said that, feel free to check though if you'd like. So I had him step out of his vehicle, and uh, while I was patting him down, he said yes, he did have some marijuana on him. So you want to come clean with me and tell me the truth, or you want to lie to me? I don't want to like this. All right, then. How much you got? I have a pistol there. How much these guys got? Uh, no one else can. I believe he was running a test to see if I was yeah, even going to check. And once he realized I was going to check, he knew he was going to be caught with it. He wanted to come clean. The passenger stated that he didn't have any, and he said he, he could also he could check him. And we did check him, and he did have it on him. What do you got there? He lied too? Yeah. All right. You got empty out all your pockets. Well, they can both go for a ride with me then. I don't like to be lied to, I told you. Put your hands up on the car. I can pat you down. Turn back around. Put your hands back up there. Go over there and put your hands on top of the car too. Just like this. What else is in this car? What else is in the car? And don't lie to me. There shouldn't be anything else in here. There shouldn't be or there isn't? What is it? There's... Don't lie. There's nothing in there. There's nothing in there. He gets done searching that vehicle. If he finds anything, and you lied to me again. I'm going to ask you, was there anything in that car? No, I had no, I had no. nothing. Nothing. I asked the kid, even though we found the marijuana on him, to search his vehicle anyway. Did I need it? No, not after I found it on him. He gave me permission, so we did search his vehicle, which came up negative. And the kid was being honest with me that he had nothing else in the car other than the marijuana on him. Your mom knows what to Yours? No. You ever been arrested before? Uh, yeah. What did you get arrested for? Uh, breaking in the cars. Breaking in the cars. Um, we've had people uh, before, you know, I don't know if they started with 10 joints or it started with one joint or whatever. They have to start somewhere. And I've seen people OD before. I've seen the ambulance people have to come in and take them out. I've seen them announced dead on scene because of a drug overdose. You know, it's bluntly going to come down to that if they keep the drugs up. Let me see your hands.
know what you're arrested for, right? No. Possession of marijuana? Now do you know what you're arrested for? Yep. Well, when someone tells me, oh, I just have, like this guy only had, maybe what he could up to about 10 joints. Yeah, sure, he had only 10 joints on him. 10 joints today, how many tomorrow? How many in the next day? You know, maybe I could stop this guy, you know, end it right now with his marijuana before it goes into something even a worse drug, cocaine, LSD, whatever it may be, heroin. These teens are barely old enough to drive. By arresting them, McCarthy hopes he'll scare them straight. The drug war goes on day and night, and Trooper O'Hanlon is always there to confront it. As I was traveling westbound on 84 in exit 5 area, I observed the green Jeep Cherokee traveling at a high rate of speed. I began clocking this vehicle at, at speeds ranging from 85 to 100 miles an hour. It's on a green Jeep. Check for a file one, please. Once I was able to pull the vehicle over safely onto the right shoulder, I approached the right side, and as I approached, I observed the passengers. They were both acting very nervous. Their stories weren't matching. What's your license registration? Where are you guys headed to? You got ID on you? At this point, I felt it was for my safety to take the operator out of the vehicle. Once you step out of the car, step the rear of the vehicle. He has things hidden in that vehicle I don't know about, so I wanted to get him on my level. As he was exiting his vehicle, I was watching through the side window. I observed him either placing something or taking something out of the underneath the driver's seat. At this point, I felt he might have had a weapon. I have no idea what he's trying to hide from me. It's very easily he could have had a handgun. Many officers have been shot doing traffic stops. Traffic stops are, are more risk than doing a tactical call, because you don't know. At least on a tactical, a tactical call, I know I'm going in after a bad guy. On a traffic stop, I could be stopping grandma going to the grocery store, or, or I'm stopping John Dillinger. At this point, I took the operator out of his vehicle and had him step to the rear. As he came to the rear of the vehicle, I immediately placed him on the back of his car, attempting to conduct a pat down. An off-duty trooper, Trooper Kraus, pulled up behind me. He saw that I was alone. At that time of night, it's during the change of shifts. Uh, backup could be 20 minutes to a half hour away. I asked Trooper Kraus to, to watch the individual as I went to see what was under his seat. Do me a favor, put your hands on the dashboard. What did he just jam under the seat? I immediately noticed a uh, clear plastic baggie containing a uh, plant-like material. Through my training experience, I, I recognize this to be uh, marijuana. In this instance, the operator was, was hiding something. He was, he was committing a felony. He was taken out of his vehicle. He was placed under arrest, at which time he became belligerent. An individual chooses the way he's going to get arrested. I'm out there doing my job. I don't, want, I don't want to roll around in the street with anybody. I wish everybody would just, you're under arrest if you're going to jail. End of story. You see if Dan Barry can start a car up here, please. Westbound at two. See, you got any more on you? No, sir. You sure? No. Huh? No. But this was um um routine traffic routine. You have to have authorization to search a vehicle. During a traffic stop, a police officer has every right to conduct what is called a pat down of the vehicle. 
whatever in the operator's reach, I can check for my safety. If you have a weapon under your seat, that's what I'm looking for. If you have any contraband, anything that might do me some harm. Well, you're under arrest right now. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be well against you. Right, so you okay. Ask for authorization to search your or well, obviously you don't. Obviously you don't know all that well. Okay. So why don't you just be quiet until you talk to an attorney? All right. Oh. Once he once he stuck his arms and he was making those furtive movements, it gave me every right to check that vehicle. In this instance, this individual felt like he was an attorney and tried to use his mouth to either push me over the edge or rile him. At this point, I told him to, to use his constitutional rights, be quiet, he's under arrest. You're under arrest. This is called search incident to arrest. Yeah, okay. I'm asking, this is called out. this is called search incident to arrest. Right now, you're in the best position for us for our safety. Okay. Even with handcuffs on. With handcuffs on. Off? No, I want you right like that. The suspect in this case was placed under arrest, taken back to uh, Troop Troop A in Southbury, where he was charged with uh, possession of marijuana with possession with intent to sell. The intent to sell came due to the fact that he had it packaged in, in separate baggies for distribution. He had it broken down for easy sales. Though illegal drug arrests are on the rise, it's alcohol that makes the highways deadly. Each year, alcohol is the primary cause in close to 20,000 highway fatalities. We're down in the city of Danbury. Uh, there was a two-car accident with, uh, with injuries. 12.30. Would you step over here in front of your truck, right? Yep. Rob? What happened tonight? I was just crossing the truck. Okay, road. put your hands on the truck for a second, all right? It's pretty late part. You got anything on you? Any weapons or anything no, like that? No, huh? Anybody else with you tonight? Yeah, she just wanted to call my sister. Okay, how much do you have to drink tonight? One beer. One beer. Uh, the Danbury officers interviewed this individual. Okay. And I want you to count to 100 for him. Okay. Can you do that? One, two. One. Try it again. I get nervous. I'm okay. very That's nervous. That's why I'm giving you more I than need... one chance. Come on. Try it again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Nope. All right. Well, listen, I'm going to have you step to my car, okay? He was placed under arrest for DWI, so he'll be going down to take an intoximeter test. Just a, just a uh, to the trained eyes of Trooper McCarthy, this driver is drunk. Look at him on the yellow line, all right? He'll get worse, you watch. Yeah, he's holding it tight now. your license registration. What are you doing drinking when you're already operating on a DWI license plus? Uh huh? Come on. He just got arrested for DWI two weeks ago. Say he's going through the classes, but the individual has definitely been drinking again. He said he had two beers at lunch. He had more than that. And it's way past lunch and the guy's hammered. Come on, Tootsie. Back of the vehicle. Stay in the car. All right, Jordan, you're ready to do a few tests. You pass the test, you'll be on your way. All right? Yes. That's simple. Yes. Count out loud. One, yes. two, Eight steps. turn around and do it back. Go ahead. One, two, three. Toe to heel, toe to heel. One, two, toe to heel. Three. Three. Four, All right, I'm going to ask you one more time, George, how much you have to drink. Don't lie to me. I had a beer down at uh, the All right. I went there with my buddies after work. Okay. All right, I George. really appreciate that, dude. Look, you know, hey. I'm already in big trouble. Big hey. trouble. All right, you need to turn around because you're going to be under arrest for DWI. Right, put your hands on the car, please. Put your hands on the car. Maybe the other hand, please. Troopers arrest over 4,000 drunk drivers a year, many of them second-time offenders.
Once I arrived at the scene to, to back up Trooper Kraus, I observed Trooper Kraus seem to be having a difficult time with, with, the, with the lone female and the child in the vehicle. The woman would not provide any, any type of identification. She ran through a stop sign. She was, uh, appeared to be intoxicated. She didn't have the child in a proper child restraint seat. Uh, police officers have an obligation to protect innocent people, and in this case, protect a child. I just got it fixed, and I was driving the, the woman, in fact, was telling us lies, and then she was getting caught in her own lies. Uh, she told us the little girl with her was her niece. The, the girl in the car is calling the woman mommy, oh, and uh, we started asking her questions. Nothing. She just started getting deeper and deeper into a lie. Once people start telling a lie, it, it's hard to stop. And then once they start getting caught, it, it's, it's easier for us to pick up. I mean, it, it almost gets ridiculous sometimes to what, how deep they get into a lie. I wanted to see in, in her handbag to see if she would provide any information. She became very adamant about not giving me the handbag. Your, let me see your purse. What do you got in your purse? Let me see your purse. What do I got in my purse? Nothing. Let me see it. No, no, Church. this is his illegal. Uh, through my training experience, that was an automatic clue to me that she was definitely hiding something that I purchased, either a weapon, uh, narcotics. Uh, for my safety, it, it was in our best interest to get that handbag away from her. It's all right. It's OK. There's nothing illegal in here. There's nothing illegal in there. OK, fine. If there's nothing illegal, we all set. I might have my sister's Car? Who cares? Okay, who cares? But she's telling me she calls you Vicky and you're mommy and you're telling me your name is Jennifer. My name is Jennifer. Okay, well, until you can show me some kind of ID, I don't have any on it. In fact, she was hiding her identity. It turned out that she was lying. She was claiming to be her sister. Mommy! Step over here, lean against the car. Amber, it's, it's okay. Mommy's okay. Mommy's okay. Are you No, no, no. no. This is Vicky. <laughs> Okay, mommy's on sit, it. Sit right here. Okay, mommy's okay. What else you got no. in here? Do that. There's nothing in there. Well, nothing are you in wanted there. for something? No, I'm not wanting for anything. It turned out that she had several outstanding warrants for her arrest. She knew if she gave her real name that she would be arrested and taken to jail. I want my mother called right now. Right now, I want my mother called. Listen. Don't me, dick. At this point, the woman became very belligerent, cursing, screaming. Uh, trying to draw attention to herself, trying to draw the people on the street, actually, to, to, to assist her, saying that she was being abused by the police. Don't f with me. Don't stop. Don't f with me, man. Sit down. Sit down right here. You sit, sit down. down. Sit down. I'm going to sue you. Don't do this in front of my child. Sit down. I thought she was your niece. I thought she was your niece. Yeah, so you thought. Sit down. Don't get up. I'm not getting up. Stay right there. Huh. You got nothing against me. You got nothing against me. Oh, yeah? Yeah? You're under arrest right now. Why? For criminal impersonation. Come on, I didn't impersonate anybody. This is Victoria. I didn't impersonate nobody. I didn't impersonate anybody. And I want to call my mother right now. Sit no, down. right now. You're not no. calling your mother. Sit down. You pig. Okay, wow. You what? really hurt me with that. You're going to hurt my kid like this. I'm not going to hurt your kid like this. Oh, you are right now? Just though. sit down. Just sit down. I'm fine, right as I am. Victoria, B-I-C-T-O-R-I-A. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. Sit down. I'm not leaving this car until my mother comes. Sit down. I'm not leaving this car until my mother comes. I'm not leaving this car until my mother comes. You're getting your daughter upset. We were trying to calm her down. She was worried about her daughter. She, in fact, was the one causing her daughter all the stress, making her daughter very upset. My feelings were more for, for the child. She is actually the victim in this case. I know how scared she was. I have a daughter at home. She must have been terrified. The daughter was very warm to us. We, I was talking to her in the vehicle. She was fine with the police being there. She wasn't worried about us at all. She was more worried about the mother screaming and cursing, acting the way she was. Why am I being arrested? Why? If a person, while I'm conducting a traffic stop, gets belligerent with me, gets aggressive toward me, of course it's gonna turn right toward them and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be protecting myself, and now I'm gonna get into a more aggressive position, because now I'm wondering why is this person getting so agitated, getting so aggressive toward me, becoming belligerent. Most normal people don't do that. I can stop 100 cars, never a question. 
It's the one person that you happen to see on TV that gets belligerent, gets out of line, and I react to that. That happened to my mama. What's that? Hold on, wait. Mom's okay. Because I was in the front. <laughs> That's not why she was stopped, though. That's not your fault. My mama She's, was driving. She forgot to stop for the stop sign. Thanks. Right? Stop sign top of the hill? You forgot to stop, right? Okay. We got Grandma coming down to get you. How's that sound? Yep, she's coming. The officer that stopped her originally, she, gave, she used a fake name. She was placed under arrest, and she's going to be up in Southbury. I think she used some words tonight I didn't even know. Into the helicopter. Fighting drugs consume state troopers' time. But as ESU team members, they can attack the supply during undercover raids at the source, the dealer's homes. Undercover narcotics officer, Detective Walt Green, wears a mask to protect his identity. Green briefs his team. He will lead his fellow narcotics officers on a raid of a suspected dealer's house. Um, all the transactions have been conducted out of the back door. We have people at the front door. I'm sitting out here in the back so nobody comes in from behind or comes in from the front. These guys, they get pissed off if they did have their gear or their, their drugs in there. One right here. Go up, go up, go up, go up, go up, go up, right there. Stick. first place. The ESU destroys thousands of dollars of marijuana crops each summer. Here's the scenario. Intelligence was gathered that there's a, a grow area. Trooper Bland and members of the ESU help train and prepare narcotics agents to go on marijuana eradication raids. Throughout the summer, uh, we're coming up on the marijuana grow season. Their narcotics task force personnel will then start to go out, look for these marijuana grow areas, move in with their personnel, and then eradicate the fields, actually destroy the fields. It's very important to train for these type of things because of the potential for violence. As a matter of fact, we had personnel from the statewide narcotics task force involved in a shootout while moving into a marijuana field. Uh, they had a, an individual who had housed himself, had to protect his field, and as the, uh, the narcotics personnel moved up toward the marijuana field, they opened fire on them. And uh, they returned fire. There was an exchange of gunfire. And what happened eventually was the tactical team ended up moving through. Drug cultivators don't hesitate to shoot first. The ESU team comes prepared. This particular weapon is an HK MP5 40 caliber submachine gun. It's a uh, magazine-fed weapon capable of semi-automatic and automatic fire. The weapon has a retractable stock, a uh, surefire light on the front of the weapon with a uh, pressure pad, and this is pretty much the mainstay of the tactical team. We utilize this particular weapon during tactical operations because it gives us a, a good shooting platform. It's very accurate and it's very reliable. This weapon here is a Colt M16, semi-automatic and, and automatic weapon. It's uh, chambered in a 223 caliber. It uh, has a magazine of 30 rounds. This weapon was utilized during the Columbia tactical call. Because it's a uh, good wood movement type weapon, it affords us a longer range. It travels well, and uh, it's a very accurate and reliable weapon. 
This weapon here is a Mossberg 12 gauge pump action. We have uh, a magazine tube that can, can accommodate five rounds. We utilize this uh, particular shotgun to fire uh, shot lock type rounds for breaching, as well as uh, gas rounds into a residence. We can fire uh, 12 gauge ferret rounds. And uh, it's a good perimeter weapon for us also. This is the, the primary weapon issued to all state troopers within Connecticut, uh, the Sig Sauer P229 40 caliber pistol. It's a semi-automatic pistol equipped with a surefire tactical light, which is pressure activated by the team member. We carry a magazine of 12 rounds. The uh, particular round that the Connecticut State Police utilizes is the uh, federal hydroshock round. The hydroshock round has a mushroom effect when it strikes an object. One week later, the tactical team puts their knowledge and training to the test. Members of the Emergency Services Unit are going to assist us, the statewide narcotics task force with uh, the eradication of a, a few uh, marijuana fields that they detected from the helicopters and uh, from the airplane. The aircraft assist the, uh, the tactical team. It's our eyes in the sky for us. They can take photos for us. They can um, actually uh, provide security for us by observation. They can circle a, uh, an area for us, whether it be a marijuana uh, grow area or a uh, resident where we have a barricaded subject. They can provide a lot of uh, valuable information for us. For this mission, the ESU will get air support from the National Guard. What they did is they flew over and they marked it with a GPS angle. They then print up the map, has the marker already laid in place, and that's the sighting where they found the uh, suspect field. The first marijuana field we're going to try and uh, try and locate and, and take down is a field that's spread out. A lot of times the growers just don't have a plot like your garden. Uh, what they'll do is they'll have a plant here and another plant maybe 20, 30 yards away, and uh, this one here is adjacent to a swamp area. So we may find some of the plants right in the swamp. Uh, it's a nice uh, water water source for the plants. The men move in, conscious that armed drug dealers might already have them in their sights. It's more like Vietnam than Connecticut. tracks to warn them of law enforcement activity. The map is accurate. The team quickly locates the first plants. Three miles in, they find the primary grow area. Now you got your marijuana plant growing in a pot right here. Oh, there, there's another one right down there. The growers attempt to protect and hide their crop has failed. Whoever and that's uh, protected by from animals, he's got some soap, uh, cut bars of soap to keep the animals away, keep them from eating his plants. Camouflage buckets, oh, yeah, drain it. holes in them. This hall will never hit the streets. We located and uh, eradicated uh, 68 marijuana plants. Marijuana, as some may consider it less of a priority in the drug war, but it's also considered a gateway drug. It's where the kids start. They start with marijuana and then they move on to something else as harsh as heroin or crack cocaine. The emergency services unit's war on drugs never stops. In drug houses, in the air, and on the sea, ESU officers meet every challenge 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The ESU is one of the only Navy certified state police dive teams in the country. They conduct regular underwater hull inspections, 
on ships arriving from known drug producing countries. Trooper First Class Dave Brundage leads the dive team. What we're looking for is any packages attached to the hull in certain areas, bilge keel areas. The bilge keel is a uh, stabilizing fin that runs down both lengths of the vessel. We swim those, looking for packages attached there. We check the screw, the rudder, uh, the coffer dam area above the rudder shaft housing. Um, that's a place where narcotics have been found in the past. Brundage briefs his men. All right, max depth here, even with high tide today, is no more, probably no more than 35 feet. Time of dive, we're going to limit it to uh, no more than 60 minutes because we're on single bottles, okay? We should be done in uh, 30, 35 minutes. Danny, what do you got for uh, air on your bottle? One final equipment check. Breathe off the rig. And they're in. They're jumping. Go. Watch your toes on the steel. All right, into the water. Do you in water checks? Each dive brings new hazards. This is probably the most uh, dangerous part of this dive or any dive that we do for customs on the vessels is diving pier side. If they run into any type of problems, they either have to help each other out, keep their heads about themselves, and then swim back out. Either swim forward, depending on where they are on the vessel, or keep swimming aft and stay low. We have had problems in the past. One of the divers in the past has gotten caught up in a uh, fishing net and zero visibility. Fortunately, we had the comms. His other dive partner got to him, as well as cut themselves free, and then they swam out. But the nice thing about it is they kept their heads about themselves. They didn't panic. The divers stay in constant contact with the surface. Understand you're on it. Let me know when you're coming to the surface by line pull signals. Let me know when you're coming to the surface by line pull signals. Three received, three sent. Coming up, take up the slack. He's, he's, getting, he's coming up pretty quick. Although today's search came up empty, these divers have hit the jackpot in the past and definitely will again. July 19th last year, I found uh, 100 pounds of cocaine in a man-made cylinder. They made it to look like an O2 cylinder. They strapped it to the bilge kill on the vessel, and uh, our divers located it. We notified customs. They elected to remove the package. We took it to an adjacent warehouse, x-rayed the package, make sure there wasn't any explosives in it, make sure there wasn't any booby traps for the divers up here. Uh, once it, we found that there was no components, any explosive components in there, uh, we breached the container. It was made out of sheet metal, very light container, and uh, uh, customs extracted, tested, and extracted the packages. And there was just about 100 pounds of uh, cocaine uh, individually wrapped up in like two, two pound packages. Once that was removed, they said, well, we, want to, we wanted to set up a sting operation to make sure that they could find out who was going to retrieve the package from the vessel. We reattached a cylindrical package. We got an O2 bottle off the rack, uh, bled it dry, put their brackets, the man-made brackets that uh, came up from Turbo on them, and reattached it to the hull of the vessel. And then later on that night, we came out and we uh, had a vessel on the far side of the harbor. And uh, we just sat up and waited for somebody to swim in. What's on this buoy right here? At about you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, uh, were two divers were spotted swimming in. All their equipment was blacked out. The regulators were all taped up with black tape, so nothing would shine. They had no uh, flashlights. The wrenches that they had and ironically fit the metric size bolts that were on the, on the, the clamp so they could remove the package. Once we saw them in the water, we, we were hailed over and we came up alongside them. Uh, one of them gave up immediately. Hey, get your hands off! What are you doing? Get in here! Watch his hand. Get your hands off! Get that other hand up! Stay face down, Florida. 
The other one tried to evade uh, being taken into custody, started swimming away. And that only lasted a few minutes because it was just easy to follow him in the boat and watch the bubbles come to the surface. Uh, he wasn't going anywhere. Uh, these divers were well out of their element. They had no flashlights, no lifelines. Uh, they were operating in zero visibility. Uh, I think they were just driven by the fact they were going to get paid good money to get this package out of here. They had no clue what they were up against. It would have been amazing if they had gotten that package off and then not drowned, uh, just because just of the conditions it was in. Since 1988, ESU divers have seized 130 kilos of cocaine. Each year, law enforcement agencies in Connecticut confiscate over $30 million of illegal narcotics. As in any real war, there are casualties. And as in any real war, there are heroes. For ESU members, the battles rage day and night in their own country, on their own streets. Crime Fighting Force, the ESU. Our job saved lives. They're fighting a new kind of criminal. Drug dealers, gangbangers, and armed robbers. Being a team member means putting yourself in harm's way. No situation is routine or normal, because if you think of it that way, you risk your life doing so. society. He's well armed and mobile. One that law enforcement agents need special equipment to handle. The specialized teams of Connecticut's Emergency Services Unit confront these criminals under the most challenging conditions. Navy trained divers hunt for illegal drugs hidden in the hulls of ships. Gately is coming up. Members of the tactical assault unit deliver overwhelming firepower and surgical precision strikes. The air wing unit provides a vital bird's eye view, giving the team an edge in tracking armed suspects and escaped convicts. And relays critical intelligence to its ground troops in the war against drugs. Thank you. Billy spells it right out for us. That's great. The canine unit takes the lead in emergency search and rescue operations. The dogs bring down armed felons. Get it up! Now, drop it! Drop the gun! Drop the gun! Drop the gun! The bomb squad disarms or detonates over 60 live explosives each year. All officers are state troopers. When crises strike, they bring a unique set of skills into the field. They all have different skills, but they share an essential ingredient. Uncommon bravery. Today, the tactical team converges to serve a warrant, one of their most dangerous tasks.
robbery and murder. The suspect rap sheet shows he could be armed and dangerous. The team proceeds cautiously. They stay alert, poised to react to anything. The ESU snipers posted around the house watch the teams every morning. The assault team moves swiftly toward an upstairs bedroom. Please stop! Drop the gun! Drop the gun! Drop it! Drop that gun! Turn around! Get down on your knees right there! Get down! Now turn to face the wall! Turn! Stop! The suspect doesn't stand a chance against these new kind of cops. Professionalism unequaled. Don't move. Don't move. You have any weapons on you? Come. All right, take off. Around opposite end of the red. Trooper First Class Dave Bland commands the team. We can monitor here at the CP your progress. There's a car is name in 70 here. troopers comprise the ESU. But only six serve full time. That guy was speeding. Bland, an expert in explosives, canine handling, and tactical assault, is one of these top six. I'm very proud to be a member of the uh, emergency services unit. Uh, in my opinion, I think I had the best job in the Connecticut State Police. Bland develops and executes team plans with an eye to minimizing risk for all involved. Search. Okay, they'll have the airplane assistant on the bottom. Close. Me and Billy will go across first, make sure it's, it's safe over there. When hostage negotiations fail, or when an armed suspect needs to be taken down, a forced entry becomes his only option. Under Bland's command, the team moves with confidence. In this particular incident, the, uh, the tactical team was called to assist the major crime squad uh, with the execution of, a, of an arrest warrant for a uh, no murderer. Uh, it was an individual who was in his residence, and uh, we, we received the assignment to, uh, to make entry into the residence and uh, secure him. When serving an arrest warrant, the TAC team moves with precision. The snipers move quickly into position and relay intelligence back to command. Land green. Green shot. Advise when in position, Charlie Delta side. Well advised. Green plan. Plans on go. In position. Roger, in position. With the sniper standing ready, Bland decides to wait for the advantage of night. This particular warrant was executed in darkness to uh, provide the tactical team uh, cover to move up to the residence. Uh, this individual was known to uh, possess uh, long rifles, scoped weapons, and uh, we had some concern about him uh, firing at team members who may be approaching his residence. Green to plan. All clear to go. Then the entry team makes them move. She was uh, pretty hysterical, a little surprised at, uh, what, that we were there. Maybe she didn't have any idea what, uh, what her boyfriend had been up to. But uh, we tried to move her away. Uh, we were actually after him, not her. Uh, he heard her cry out, and uh, he turned and became combative, and he had to be taken into custody uh, in the manner he was. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! 
Leave her alone! 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 Leave
Sometimes the success of an entire mission depends on a single Cold War shot. The Cold War shot is that first round coming out of that, uh, your barrel when you fire your weapon. The barrel's nice and cold, so it's not heated up at all. Uh, that's your first shot. That was your Cold War? Right. The barrel's heated up in your back end. Did you change your position anywhere in there? I did not. So you left the center mass in there, huh? Still in there. If you have a shot and you're given the green light or you have to neutralize a threat, that's the first round coming out of your weapon. So your weapon has to be tuned in for that range. BSU snipers rely on their weapon of choice, the Remington 308. Eliminating a threat from over 100 yards is a task most law enforcement agents cannot perform. It requires a steady hand, a sure eye, and practiced reflexes. Recertification under close supervision assures that ESU snipers will meet their goal. 100% accuracy for those tense moments when it really counts. John likes going for the eye duck areas, so this was his first shot, his cold war shot right here, and his second shot off the heated barrel. Cold war shot has to be within the kill zone, which is across the eyebrows, under the eyes, and around the nose. But expert shooting is only part of the challenge they face. Suspects don't wait out in the open. ESU snipers often have to track through rough terrain under the worst of conditions, set up their sniping position, press their eye to the telescopic sight, and hold, and hold, and hold. Staying in that cramped position for hours on end. But the price they pay is worth it. The entry team, confident that they are covered, is now free to move in. Whenever we're shooting, we're uh, practicing for that, that one particular moment that may never come in our lifetime, but if it does come, we have to be prepared and ready. ESU snipers, on call, on the front line. Realistically, incident. On TV quite a bit, you, you do see the, uh, the SWAT teams moving in. There's a lot of gunfire and people are being shot and there's a lot of firing going on. But realistically, that's not true. Uh, we too try to go in there and we try to save lives and we try to uh, have a peaceful resolution to any type of incident. The ESU tactical team is the most powerful strike force in the state of Connecticut. today are a fairly recent law enforcement innovation. On August the 1st, 1966, a lone gunman stood on the observation deck of the Texas Clock Tower building on the University of Austin campus. For 90 minutes, police stood by helplessly as the shooter killed over a dozen people and wounded 30 others. This type of tragedy was becoming all too common across the country. Police needed to be able to combat this new type of heavily armed criminal. Law enforcement was pretty much caught off guard because it wasn't able to handle type, those type of situations. And what they did is they looked into it and, and uh, realized that they need specialized training, special equipment, and special personnel to handle those type of situations. Specialized SWAT and tactical units were formed based on military doctrine. This mandate required new training and new equipment. A new way of thinking for law enforcement command. One of the most important new skills police officers have had to master is entry under fire. If we go in on a call, we normally go in in a stack, what we call configuration, where you'll have one guy behind the other. This is a, a two-man 
utilizing the shield and what they're doing is they're coming in, they're looking for their target, they're maintaining their field of fire and what it does is it expands his field of fire because he's now out this way, the other one is covering the other area and it almost gives it a fan effect. Okay, don't forget, you gotta stick to the number two, you gotta be behind the shield man. Go a little slower, slower, slower. Yeah, a little slower, crouch down a little more. Okay, look good. Look good. That's half the battle. Right. You're never going to get around having some type of vulnerability. The shield provides you with protection. If his hand gets hit, let's say, that's what the other guy's there for. Whatever happens, he's going to deal with it. When we do the stacks, they're coming into a room. This is his area. If a shot goes off behind him, he won't move. He's trained on this area because there could be another adversary over there. Well, you don't want to turn this way. You leave your area, and now somebody pops out of a closet and kills the whole team. What we try to do is ensure that everybody can do everything on the team. We may have a sniper who we're not going to use in a sniper capacity on that particular call. We may use him as an entry person. That's why you'll see cross-training going on. In preparing to take down the modern criminal, who is often armed with machine guns and powerful weaponry, team members need to develop a new set of skills, different from that of a normal state trooper. Team members must train and develop expertise with a variety of weapons. Here, Trooper First Class Joe Delahanty practices his marksmanship on the obstacle firearms course. Each ring represents a direct hit. High speed pursuit is a dangerous problem in modern police work. For the ESU members, that means spending time on the track with Sergeant Russell Stevens. I'll let you get a shot at it. Stevens lays the groundwork. So it's going to snap right back around, and then you got to bring it right it back. It may look easy, but at 100 miles an hour, a wrong turn or a blown tire can prove deadly. Traveling on, on wet roads and slippery roads, we put ourselves at risk as well. That's why we need to train on the recruit level at driving. We train uh, on the tactical team at driving to keep our skills sharp so we can respond in a quick and safe manner. The first exercise we're going to do is called the evasive maneuver exercise. This lane right here demonstrates or illustrates the middle travel portion of the highway. We're going to go down the middle travel portion of the highway. The three cones that are dead straight ahead are our middle lane that becomes blocked. Now we either have to go left or go right to avoid the object that's blocked right in front of us. What I do is I tell the recruits to pick up speed. They're going to take the speed off the gas. Right here, I'll tell them left or right. The lane's blocked, you come back on center. It's all, you, you use a nine and three hand position, it's left and right, left and right. The same amount of steering input that I put in, I have to take right back out. So what I'm going to demonstrate here is what happens when a person's driving down the road and what we call panic braking. A person travels down the road, the ball runs in front of them, the deer jumps out of the woods in front of them. All they do is they grab the wheel, they white knuckle the wheel, and they hit those brakes as hard as they can. You get a weight transfer to the front, front tires, front tires will lock. You can turn the wheel to the left or to the right, and that vehicle is just going to keep on sliding straight and hit the object you're trying to avoid. The next exercise is called a J-turn exercise. You see it a lot in the movies, but it's not an exercise that's used every day. When a call comes in, we need to get there as a team. We need to get there quickly, get suited up, and get ready to roll. That's why we have to exceed the posted speed limit to get there in a safe manner, in a quick manner, so we can get together, get formed, and go on the call. Members of the ESU TAC team must train with a variety of specialized equipment. The battering ram that we utilize here with the tactical team is utilized to gain entry through a doorway. What we'll do is we'll have a team member who will come up, he'll be covered by the ballistic shield, he'll come, he'll swing the ram at the doorway to, make, to break it and to uh, allow the team to make entry. This tactical vest here is a uh, ProTech. 
level four tactical vest. Uh, it has uh, two ballistic panels within the vest, removable ballistic panels. Uh, a level four strike plate, what it does is uh, it offers uh, the tactical team member protection against uh, natal type uh, rounds up to a, a 308. On the back of the vest, we have our uh, radio and uh, the radio itself is wired into the vest. We have an earpiece that comes from the uh, from the radio to the trooper. We also have a push to talk button on the front of the vest. Roger, he's going west through the cornfield, right? This uh, vest one is fully loaded with the equipment. The ammunition that the uh, tactical team member will uh, utilize weighs approximately 45 pounds. We have here our uh, it and night vision goggles. These are uh, generation three, current issue to the US military, and uh, the tactical team also utilizes these uh, goggles. Uh, we would utilize the night vision goggles uh, on a perimeter post. Uh, team members will be equipped with these to, uh, to monitor a uh, residence or a particular target that we have. Also, these can be utilized, these particular goggles, when we're clearing buildings. What these uh, goggles do is they amplify any available ambient light. These goggles have a feature that if a uh, if the tackle team member is exposed to a bright light, they they automatically shut down and protect us from any type of blindness. These goggles can be mounted to the helmet, so while a team member is making movement, he can have his helmet on and he can wear it. And also, what can happen too is a team member can flip him out of the way if he comes into a lighted area. Ballistic shields that are utilized by the State Police Tactical Team are Protec uh, Body Bunker Shields. These particular shields are rated to a level three. Level three meaning that it'll stop small arms ammunition, some shotgun ammunition, and a uh, small amount of uh, rifle fire. Shields carried by one of the team members were uh, most more than likely the first team member to make an entry into an area. And what it does is it provides us mobile protection, and it, it also provides tech protection for the entire team. What happens is a team member will carry the shield, look through the, uh, the clear viewport, which is also a ballistic protection, and then moves about wherever they're going to go. The tactical team utilizes a defense technology number 25 distraction device. To gain some time while we're making an entry, what we want to do is make an entry onto a residence or to a building and uh, dis distract the people inside so that we can have a little bit more time when we come in there. A call comes in from police intelligence. They have located a biker gang member suspected of assassinating a police informant. The tag team mobilizes. Wherever they are, team members drop what they're doing and race to the staging area. It's kind of hard to explain to my uh, six-year-old son. See, and I just got home from work, en route to take him to uh, see a movie, and then we get a tactical call out. I got to bring him home. Bland and Sergeant Ricky Stevens discuss their strategy as team members continue to arrive. Initially, we should stack on the door. We want to come out to the front porch. We'll kneel them down right there. Stevens heads up the Eastern tactical team. I want them to come out to the front. Why? Because I want the truck here with the lights. We're going to be able to light him up and see exactly what we're doing. Intelligence reports that the suspect has a history of cocaine use, violence, and possession of firearms. Land and Stevens decide to utilize special weapons in the assault. Before, yeah, you mind a beanbag shotgun? Yeah. Do I mind it? Yeah. Versus an uh, MP5? Yeah, well, you, can, you can take it both yeah. if you want, but I'd like to have the beanbag there. Okay, we'll have Russ, we have Russell too. Russell's gonna have it for uh, shot line. The East team will strike from the front, while the West team will move in from the rear. The entry must be quick and decisive. The suspect is probably armed. Ricky, 
Yes, sir. Oh, you want me to pull it in the driver? Right in the driver. Put your headlights facing this front door. The East team takes the lead vehicle. The West team follows in the tactical yeah. truck. I'll be two. Yeah. Okay, everybody knows where the, where the gang is going to stay behind for security. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, we'll keep myself in tempo. We're all set, Dan. We're set. Are you all set with the ram and all that? Or do you need me yes. to carry something? No, I got it right here. Okay. okay. Everybody locked and loaded up with their pistols? Yeah. Yeah. Goggles down. Everybody goggles down. Do you have them? Everybody locked and loaded. Weapons unsafe. Okay. okay. Slow and methodical. Secures the building quickly and methodically. But the suspect has been tipped off, and the house is empty. Roger. We're all secured. We're just gonna check the basement. Now, apparently, the uh, suspect has uh, fled the scene prior to our arrival. It's not a wasted night. The panic suspect left key evidence inside, which leads to a further assignment for the ESU dive team. The dive team is the only Navy certified state police team that specializes in surface supplied air dives. This allows divers to stay underwater for lengthy periods, necessary for operations like airplane disaster rescues, shipwrecks, or missing person searches. This team specializes in drug search and seizure and evidence recovery. Detectives believe that the suspect discarded his murder weapon in this river. ESU divers must find the gun to make a conviction stick. Arriving on scene, the team fans out in a grid pattern, searching depths from six inches to 30 feet over an area nearly 100 yards wide. Metal detectors aid in the search. Understand you're on it. Let me know when you're coming to the surface by line pull signals. Let me know when you're coming to the surface by line pull signals.
Nearly two hours later, team members find the magazine with one round still in the clip. Subsequent ballistics examination matches the round to those found on the scene and in the murder victim. The police now have the evidence they need to make an arrest. Where it's it's the worst of the worst because you you're getting called there for a situation that normal law enforcement personnel, I don't want to say can't handle, but may not be equipped or trained to handle. Uh, you're called in because you have special equipment, you have shields, you have ballistic helmets, you have uh, heavier firepower than the normal road uh, officer has. For the ESU, there's always a right weapon for the job. Yeah, this particular weapon is an HK MP5 40 caliber submachine gun. It's a uh, magazine-fed weapon capable of semi-automatic and automatic fire. The weapon has a retractable stock, a uh, surefire light on the front of the weapon with a uh, pressure pad, and this is pretty much the mainstay of the tactical team. We utilize this particular weapon during tactical operations because it gives us a, a good shooting platform. It's very accurate and it's very reliable. This weapon here is a Colt M16, semi-automatic and, and automatic weapon. It's uh, chambered in a 223 caliber. It uh, has a magazine of 30 rounds, has a retractable stock, it's a uh, good wood, wood movement type weapon. It affords us a longer range. It, uh, it uh, travels well, and uh, it, it's a very accurate and reliable weapon. This weapon here is a Mossberg 12 gauge pump action. We have uh, a magazine tube that can, can accommodate five rounds. We utilize this uh, particular shotgun to fire uh, shot lock type rounds for breaching as well as uh, gas rounds into a residence. We can fire 12-gauge uh, ferret rounds. And uh, it's a good perimeter weapon for us also. The tactical team utilizes a Sig Sauer P229 40 caliber pistol. It's a semi-automatic pistol. Equipped with a surefire tactical light, which is pressure activated. Carry a magazine, magazine of 12 rounds, this is the, the primary weapon issued to all state troopers within Connecticut. The uh, particular round that the Connecticut State Police utilizes is the uh, federal hydroshock round. The hydroshock round has a mushroom effect when it strikes an object. We need the weapons that we have because they're specific to a different job. An M16 or an AR-15 is the right weapon to have. They're in a woods movement, in an open area, as a perimeter weapon. Yet, if we make entry into a residence, you want an MP5. A, uh, a shoulder fired weapon because it's the most accurate and it's the most reliable. You have to go in there with the best tools. When not on call with the ESU tag team, troopers like Dan McCarthy return to their duties on the state highway patrol. bail jumpers to handling domestic disputes. From DWI stops toe to heel, toe to heel. To clocking speeders, they remain consummate professionals. Trooper Dan McCarthy one of the finest police officers the state has to offer. My first combat situation with the Ranger Battalion was in the Grenada. It was the lowest combat jump ever conducted um, into Grenada. And the Ranger Battalion is the only one that did it, 1st and 2nd Battalion. It was those kinds of experiences that helped me uh, mentally and physically prepare myself for tactical operations. In the Ranger Battalion, you were an elite team. You worked as a team, you were close as a team. Well, I find the same thing in our tactical unit. I mean, I'd even find it even tighter. You're an extremely tight unit when you're with these guys. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody treats everybody with respect. There's a time for fooling around, and there's a time for seriousness. And we really work real, real close as a team.
some of the most difficult calls troopers must answer involve domestic disputes and violence. Here, McCarthy has to make snap judgments, sorting out who's telling the truth and whose rights need to be guarded. Linda, how you doing? Mind if I step in? This woman's husband has been calling her every few minutes, threatening to kill her. He owns two guns. To McCarthy, this makes a common and too familiar recipe for danger. Can you pick it up and I'll talk to him? Well, pick it up. Hello? How you doing? Who's this? This is Trooper McCarthy with the Connecticut State Police. Who am I speaking with? What is your name, sir? Jim? Jim, what seems to be the problem? You want to pick up your clothes and just leave? Okay, like I said, we're going to take... The, the woman asks McCarthy to take right. the guns, but okay, legally I'm gonna he cannot. Take him out to your car, and I'm going to put him in your car. All right? You're going to take him with you. No, no, no. See, they're unloaded. All right? All he can do trunk, is unload them trunk, and put them in a secure mom, okay? location. Take him in the house and leave him in the house. All right? After the woman leaves, her husband arrives. One good thing, you didn't drive here because you're intoxicated. No. I can smell it on you, all right? Drink. Drive me. All right? Your wife's not here. So the house is yours. Your wife left. She's staying at a motel tonight. She thought you were going to hurt her. She was scared. She was scared. All right? Do so, you hey, honestly you say that? No, I don't think you will. And you know what? And I don't and I hope hey. to God you won't. All right? No, go, go Let's leave it at that then. Have a oh, good sir. night. Brian said that my dad was threatening her. McCarthy is about to leave when the morning. couple's son arrives to confront his father. You just want to get your stuff? You start yelling at him? Yeah, I start yelling at him. Listen up. Drunk. Listen up. Hey. You get your clothes and you get on your merry way. This is his house. You get your stuff out of it now and take off. All right, let him in to get his clothes. And then go on, right now. Get your stuff, don't take anything else, and you're on your merry way. And I want you back here until he, your mother or him, uh, if you, you come back with your mom, that's one thing. How old are you? 18 years old, all right. Um, if you come back with your mom, that's fine. You get in a confrontation with him, I'm arresting you. Okay, go grab your stuff. Well, it's a shame it's gotta come to this, you know? I don't care who you believe me, no believe It doesn't matter who I believe, I'm just, I don't, I'm not here to believe anybody. I agree. If there's, a, if there's a problem where you two go cup to cup, I'm arresting both of you. I just said I that. He's on his way. Hey, he's on his way. We're going to leave it at that. Hell you can go no. back in your house. Once he gets his stuff, that's it. All right, when I go to a call, I'm, I'm there for the safety of everybody. Whether good guy, bad guy, doesn't matter. I'm there to make sure everybody's safe. McCarthy resolves the situation peacefully and returns to patrol. For him, even a routine radar stop bristles with the danger of the unknown. I was uh, conducting a laser radar uh, on the highway and got a vehicle coming in at a high rate of speed in the 80s. So I took off after the vehicle, called it into the troop, ran the plate, and the plate came back as a stolen motor vehicle. The suit went out for approximately 10 miles. When you're driving at a high rate of speed like that in a pursuit, you have so much to concentrate on. You're not just concentrated on that vehicle in front of you, but you're now concentrated on exactly where your locations are. You have to call in your locations all the time. You're waiting for backup, so they have to know where you're at. Just approaching. You're concentrating on all the traffic around you. If someone makes a wrong move, cuts in your lane, because he wanted to get out of the way for the lights and sirens, then you're going to have to react to that. 84, 85 miles per hour for uh, motor vehicle violations. Uh, he's not stopping. Perfect. Uh, one uh, white male, it looks like. The bad guy has one thing to concentrate on. He's just going. Boom, he's gone. We have to concentrate on everything. Pursuit policy is very touchy in our department. Nobody likes to get into a pursuit. Um, pursuit endangers not only the person I'm pursuing, endangers my life, endangers every single person on that highway. So if it's not going to be a safe pursuit, we're not even going to get into it. 1195 Juke C, now approaching exit 69, speed still about 84 miles per hour, picking up a little. Looks like he's getting off exit 69. We 
We are getting off exit 69 at this point. Getting off exit 69. Speed's 50 miles per hour. Individual is taking a left. He's taking a left off exit 69. Okay, at this point we're uh, heading down a residential area. Whenever a pursuit uh, leaves the highway and goes into a residential area, you have to step back and reevaluate the whole entire situation. Just past North River Road. Um, you have to watch out for people on the streets, people walking on the sidewalks. We have to concentrate on everything. When we got off, pace slowed down. It was at an average pace. He was being a little more cautious, the guy was pursuing. So we continued with the pursuit. Negative, he's taking a right onto Evergreen. A right onto Evergreen, which is a dead end. Taking a right onto Evergreen, which is a dead end. When I knew he was turning onto a dead end street, I knew there was no way he could get back out. He bailed out of his vehicle and started running. At the point when I started after him, I heard the freeze because the police dog was going to be released. I stopped, he didn't stop running, and the police dog took him down. Hey, police stop us, the dog! Come on! Get him, boy! Come on! Get him, boy! Come on! Get him, Officer removed his dog from the guy, threw the cuffs on him, and brought him in. This teenager stole a car and put Trooper McCarthy's life at risk because he was late for basketball practice. There's no situation that is normal. There's no situation that is routine. Because if you think of it that way, you risk your life doing so. When you do a motor vehicle stop, for example, uh, and you stop a car, those situations are not normal. When you walk up to that car, that individual is in his area. He's got his area there. He knows what's in it. If he has a weapon, he has access to that. Uh, it's a very dangerous situation. How fast are you traveling? 63. All right, you know what the speed limit is? 55. All right. Let me see your logbook. Your logbook up to date? Is it up to date? The reason it's uh, very dangerous for any motor vehicle uh, stop is you never know who you're going up to on a vehicle. No matter what, whether you're running uh, radar, running the laser, you're just pursuing somebody, no matter what it is, you stop somebody for a motor vehicle violation, whether it be an old lady, whether it be an older man, whether it be kids, you're approaching that vehicle, you have no idea what you're approaching at this point. These troopers, when they walk up, they may appear cold or they may appear uh, non-caring, but the bottom line is their life is at jeopardy. Uh, in the past, we've had troopers killed on motor vehicle stops, uh, being hit by vehicles. We've had troopers shot to death. Uh, the bottom line there is they have to be professional. I'm Trooper Albert with the state police. Would I need your license, registration? All right. Your medical card, you have a log book? Long hours on the road and tight deadlines can make truck drivers a constant threat to both motorists and police officers. Hey, this guy's gonna have some problems with his brakes. There's some cracked brake pads down there. Accidents involving truck drivers claim the lives of over 4,000 Americans annually. Troopers like ESU member Tim O'Hanlon know that staying alert means staying alive. If a person, while I'm conducting a traffic stop, gets belligerent with me, gets aggressive toward me, of course it's gonna turn right toward them. I'm going to be protecting myself, and now I'm going to get into a more aggressive position because now I'm wondering why is this person getting so agitated, getting so aggressive toward me. A couple years ago on the Mara Parkway, I stopped the car, and as I made the approach, I made a right-hand approach, and I looked in the, uh, the opera window. The operator was actually pulling the gun out of the console and he placed it up to his shoulder. At that point, I reached into his passenger window and just pulled it. The gun and him backwards ended up pulling him out of the car and took him into custody. Uh, Not all troopers are so lucky. More police officers were killed during traffic stops the previous year than in all other types of incidents combined. Sir, I am a United States trooper, a soldier of the law. To me, it's a trust in the honor of the department. I will serve the state of Connecticut, honestly and faithfully. And if need be, lay down my life, as others have done. 
the Connecticut Police Academy honors officers who have lost their lives in the line of duty. Academy instructor, Sergeant Russell Stevens, remembers one of his classmates. Russell Bagshaw was, was, was checking a, uh, a sporting store. As he rolled up to the sporting store, um, two perpetrators jumped out. One jumped out, actually, and started firing rounds at him and shot and killed him. This memorial stands as a sobering reminder of what the future may hold for these heroic public servants, no matter how well trained. The life or death seriousness of their chosen work, etched in stone. The ESU members make great personal sacrifices to protect their families and their communities. The time they have at home is precious. Any call could be their last. Their families understand. This is the life they've chosen. We don't have vacations or holidays. We, we certainly don't have holidays because Tim's always working holidays. And um, vacations? We really haven't had any vacations. We went on our honeymoon and um, Timmy got called into court. They felt sorry for us so uh, they, uh, he, he told them that we were on our honeymoon and he got called in. But, uh, Christy, what do you think about Daddy going out on calls? They know these men risk their lives so others will survive. My little boy Ryan, he's five years old. I have a little girl, Morgan, she's three years old. They're great. They're what I live for, really. Um, I do everything with them. I really don't work any overtime because I spend all my time with these guys. We're young. Uh, we swim a lot. We swim a real lot in the backyard here. I just spend all my time with them. These guys are what uh, make it all worthwhile. You can work, that's one thing. You deal with the trash at work. And uh, you deal with nice people too, but a lot of scum too. And uh, this is what you live for, you know? You got your good guys at home. Tell me, do you know what your daddy does for a living? Mm-hmm. What's he do? He puts bad guys in jail. What kind of bad guys? You know, like Mr. Freeze and Two Face and the Riddler. Tomorrow, these real life heroes will be back on the front lines, battling real bad guys, putting themselves in harm's way. It's very volatile, and a spark from the light switch to destroy a house. Hold the hole! Dedication. The dog was pulling very hard on the leash and whining and giving me all the indications that he was going to find something. The Emergency Services Unit. An elite group of men who thrive under pressure. That was a good size. An elite group of men with nerves of steel. open spaces to urban landscapes. It's only 20 minutes from the dangerous streets of New York City. And big city crime knows no borders. Stay police door for us, the door! The ESU was created to deal with the extreme situations that everyday police officers are not trained or equipped to handle. I want the truck here with the lights. We're going to be able to light him up and see exactly what we're doing. Drug smuggling, armed robbery, murder, drunk driving, domestic violence. These are the ingredients of their everyday lives. A diet of danger. It's a quiet day in suburbia until a frantic call comes into the ESU. Someone has threatened to blow up a local shopping mall, and a suspicious package has been found in a janitor's closet. The 
the ESU bomb squad converge on the mall and evacuate it immediately. Working quickly and confidently, the bomb squad, headed by Trooper First Class Jim Carney, begins to defuse the volatile situation. Using the latest in police technology, Carney sends in the squad's robot to minimize danger to his men. The robot, nicknamed Henry, is the ESU's eyes and ears in the danger zone. Sure and steady, Carney guides the robot through the entered mall. Henry scans with his video eye, his robotic arm ready to retrieve the potentially deadly package. Carney maneuvers Henry with skill and caution. Operating this robot may look no tougher than maneuvering a remote control car, but its robotic arm is heavy and sluggish. Carney delicately lowers the robotic arm, fitted with an X-ray device, into place. Henry gets the shot, and Carney guides him back to the truck to develop and assess the film. And we saw components in there that we didn't like. Uh, so rather than having a human being pick it up, we had the robot pick it up. Handling deadly devices requires precision and concentration, skills mastered through hours of training. One misstep could lead to disaster. Henry can operate in all types of terrain and weather. His battery carries four hours of charge. Robots like Henry can operate up to a quarter of a mile from the command post. Henry places the package in the bomb transporter, which is designed to withstand a blast equal to 38 sticks of dynamite. The bomb squad takes the package to a remote location and prepares for a controlled detonation. Jim Carney is one of the finest bomb technicians in the world. I've been with the Connecticut State Police now 24 years, and I've been with the Emergency Services Unit for 11 years. I've been a bomb tech for 11 years, a diver for 18 years, and SWAT team for 19 years. Carney's move into the ESU was a natural step. I joined the Marine Corps, and I volunteered for an elite uh, unit in the Marine Corps called Force Recon. Um, I did a tour of duty in Vietnam. Uh, part of my duties in uh, Force Recon were airborne, uh, scuba, UDT. Uh, so a lot of those uh, skills that I learned in the Marine Corps, I brought over into the Connecticut State Police Emergency Services Unit. We would go in under the cover of darkness, plant our charges, and then detonate the charges, and then go back into the mountains before we discovered. Trooper First Class Dave Brundage joins Carney to prepare for the detonation. We're now preparing a uh, water disruptor charge. Basically what it is is two steel pipes. It'll be filled up with the uh, amount of water. And by using a small amount of uh, a low explosive in a shotgun shell, we will be projecting that water at a high rate of speed at the package. It's not technically blowing the package up, but it's actually ripping the package apart with the water pressure. The bomb techs steer clear as Henry places the package downrange. Next, 
Next, Carney and Brundage attach the water detonation device to Henry's mechanical claw. disruptor up to what's called a firing line, which will be set off by a blasting machine, a 10-cap blasting machine. It's nothing more than a small little generator. It'll generate enough uh, electricity to set off the uh, water disruptor. Because the water is traveling at uh, such a high rate of speed at that, sh at that short distance, uh, before the integrity of the electrical system knows it's been violated, the package is ripped apart and it cannot make a complete circuit. Disruptor! The destroyed package is now harmless. And this is what showed up on the x-ray was the wire that made us nervous. Subsequent examination revealed that the bomb contained enough explosives to have easily killed anyone in the vicinity. Recently in Canada, uh, the Canadian law enforcement forces up there, especially in the Quebec area, in the last three years they have lost three robots. Had that been actually human being, bomb tech, uh, they would have had three deaths in their uh, law enforcement community. Today, bombs come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, we have... Difficult for even the most trained ESU bomb tech to identify. Sometimes the only one who can get in safely and locate a package is a member of the ESU's K-9 unit. Trooper Dave Brundage relies on his friend and partner, Hallie. I've been doing this for a number of years now. I'm very happy that I'm doing it. I can't imagine not doing it. Um, it's a great opportunity to work with. Um, it gets us involved in a lot more than um, we normally would be as a regular road trip. The ESU deploys two categories of dogs, specialty dogs and patrol dogs. The specialty dogs are either bloodhounds or retrievers. Dave's partner, Hallie, is a Labrador retriever. Handlers take training aids home, whether they be explosive or narcotics, minute uh, amounts of these things. And these things are planted around the, uh, the house or the area where the trooper works. And that dog uh, has to find these training aids in order to be uh, rewarded with food. And that's how it gets all of its nourishment. And anyone that's ever raised any kind of a, a lab knows that uh, next to play, their most favorite thing in the whole world is food. So we found that uh, these dogs work very hard for us. Uh, they're great family uh, pets. They socialize well when they're taken uh, out into uh, the public. Everyone likes to pet them. We've never had an incident where there's an accidental bite or anything like that, which makes them real popular when you're doing uh, things like dignitary protection or uh, mass crowds where you end up sending dogs through. Everybody wants to pet the labs, and of course that's permissible. That's probably not a good thing to do with a patrol dog. They're different temperament, and uh, especially when they're in the cars, they're very protective of that. The dogs of the ESU K-9 team maintain a close relationship with their handlers. Hallie and Brundage make a formidable team. We were contacted by ATF to assist them in rendering safe several pipe bombs that were purchased during a sting operation. We were called into the city of Meriden where there was a number of arrests made uh, ATF agent indicated there were pipe bombs left behind in the accused's vehicle. The question initially arose that are the pipes live pipe bombs or was the accused attempting to rip off the individual he was selling the pipes to as empty pipe bombs. Hallie and Brundage searched the vehicle for any trace of explosive material. If Hallie finds anything, she'll sit and look to be rewarded. Viewing the pipes from, my, from where I was standing, I could see that they were fused. We were uncertain at this time if the canine was just alerting solely on the odor available here or if the pipes were actually filled with explosive powders. 
Brundage relies on Halley's trained nose and treats the pipes as live bombs. He sends in Trooper First Class Billy Rochette with a robotic arm called a hot stick so the package can be safely removed from the car. The first goal, as always, minimize risk of human injury. The robotic claw at the end of the hot stick allows the bomb tech to safely move the package to the awaiting bomb transporter. these pipes from the vehicle, put them in our transport vessel, and removed ourselves from the city limits so that we can breach these or countercharge them and uh, render them safe. One of the render safe procedures we have is we have a way of placing an explosive charge on the pipes, and when, they are, when it's detonated, we end up with an end result like this. The pipe is cut into with the explosive charge, and the powders inside are vented out through the opening. Now in a deserted location, Brundage prepares to detonate the bombs. What we're doing right now is setting up a site to place the pipe bombs. We dig a hole because after the detonation, we want to collect as much of the shrapnel as possible for evidentiary value. Plus, this minimizes any of the shrapnel traveling downrange and injuring any of the observers or the techs. The bomb techs clear the area as Rochette places the package in the detonation zone. Pipe bombs are fairly delicate because they're usually uh, made from smokeless powders and black powders and um, they're highly uh, susceptible to heat shock and friction. So we need to be exceptionally careful if they knock together, if they drop, um, any, any type of movement like that could set something like that off. slow-burning fuse is ignited. This device gives Rochette exactly two minutes to clear the area. devilish devices. Carney brings his years of experience to train the next generation of bomb techs so they can meet the unknown challenges ahead. Follow the hole! Follow the hole! Go ahead. In the Connecticut State Police and the bomb squad, we don't only believe in bomb disposal, we believe in teaching and we believe in training. Uh, I've been extremely lucky. I've done a lot of traveling and lecturing. I've lectured in Russia, Germany, England, Ireland. And I've trained officers from uh, Egypt, uh, Cyprus, Greece, Chile. If you think that, hey, I got this bright, shiny badge from uh, Greenwich, uh, New London, Woodbury, whatever the case may be, and nobody's going to dare touch me, you're dead wrong. Connecticut State Police stats last year, we did 388 bomb calls. Out of the 388 bomb calls, 57 of those calls were actual ticking bombs. So one out of every fifth call that I go on will be a live bomb. That means we are doing one bomb a week here in the state of Connecticut. One bomb a week. The University of Connecticut, the dangerous smell of ether, fills the air as several open canisters are discovered. The ESU's Jim Carney, Dave Bland, and Dave Brundage move in. Ether has become a problem for uh, all the bomb squads around the United States. Ether is used in a lot of illegal uh, drug labs. Uh, they, they use the ether, uh, then it uh, becomes useless to them, and then they try to, they, they'll either leave it in the building or they'll just leave it out on the street. The team finds a safe area nearby 
Well, they will ultimately detonate the unstable ether. What we're going to do now is we're going to uh, prepare the uh, disposal pits. Uh, because of the amount of uh, ether that we found, we're going to do the uh, disposal in two shots. Basically, what we're doing is we're digging the hole so it contains the shot, and we're trying to directionalize the shot that if anything does happen, it goes straight up and now out to the side. Yeah, we're going to go back up to where the uh, ether is being uh, stored, and uh, Dave will dress out in the bomb suit, and he'll remain in the bomb suit for the rest of the operation. The ESU's advanced Medeng ED-07 bomb suit is reinforced with 21 layers of Kevlar, the same material used in bulletproof vests. It's always nice to, uh, when you're not doing something like this, to strut around saying you're a bomb technician, but when you're actually on the job overneath a bomb or explosive or even dangerous chemical, it's nervous because there's a lot of things that you're trained to do and there's no problems, but there's always the, uh, the unexpected. Brundage knows that the sweltering heat could destabilize and detonate the ether at any moment. What uh, Dave is doing right now is taking the individual cases of ether going up onto the back of the bomb truck now. We have a total of three cases with approximately about 13 to 14 bottles. Ether is very volatile, uh, especially when it builds up fumes. Just by walking into a room, lighting a match, or even creating a spark from a light uh, switch can set off and actually destroy a whole uh, house. Eight ounces of unstable ether is equal to one stick of dynamite. And we had three cases, and each case had approximately 16 cans of ether in it. As the team brings the ether to the prepared detonation site, all that stands between Brundage and the deadly chemicals is his bomb suit. But one part of his body remains vulnerable. If the bomb went off and we had the bomb in our hands, then we would lose our hands. The gloves out there are too thick, too padded, and it doesn't give us the dexterity to move around and to, uh, do the things that we have to do. Brundage holds the ether securely in his bare hands and carries it down to the disposal pit. All right, what Dave is doing now downrange is he's preparing the shots. He's wrapping each individual container with a wrap of deck core, which is a high explosive. The team makes final preparations. It has a shotgun primer at the end there with the nipple on it, and it has hooked up to like a pen flare. And uh, when the pen flare goes home, it hits the shotgun primer. The primer spits a little spit of flame that will rupture the, um, the plastic tube, ignite the, um, the fine dusting of uh, HMX inside, and it will uh, detonate the high explosive downrange. One down, one to go. It was very successful. As you can see, the fireball, it can totally consume the, uh, the product that we were worried about. Uh, so it was a very successful operation. The ESU team boasts a nearly perfect safety record in the disposal of bombs and combustible materials. But sometimes the call comes too late. What do we got? They got. Uh, Is there bodies down down there? No, no, they got everybody out. They had uh, two, two uh, blasters working over a hole. They were camping it and uh, apparently camping on the cap, and the thing went off. One of them got blown off the uh, 75 feet. He came down, he got broken up pretty bad. The uh, second one has got second and third degree burns. Okay. And, uh, he's hurt pretty bad. And what they got now is a loaded hole, and we got dynamite scattered all over the place. Anytime we go out on a call, we're putting our life at risk. Uh, we try not to think about it, but it's always there. Uh, we try to take everything into consideration. But like we say, Murphy is always there, Murphy's Law. Something can go wrong that we have no control over. One wrong move can mean instant death for the ESU team members, whether answering a bomb call, a dive call, or tactical mission. They take every precaution. One of the best ways ESU members protect themselves doesn't involve weapons or bomb suits. It's their four-legged partners, the patrol dogs. The backbone of the canine unit is still the patrol dog. They're all male German shepherds. And the patrol dogs are trained in a, a variety of things. Trooper Jim Codges and his partner Wilder form one of the most successful teams in the Canine Corps. 
My partner is K9 Wilder. He's a four-year-old male German Shepherd that was donated from the Fidelco Guide Dog Foundation. Uh, he's been working with me for a little under two years, and his primary function as patrol dog is evidence recovery, tracking humans, and handler protection. Yeah. I can call Wilder either by voice commands. Oh. by hand commands. And the third way is if I, Wilder perceives a threat, he'll come to my aid. If I were to call the dog out of the car to assist me, or he would to perceive a threat, it would take the dog literally seconds and just seconds to come to my aid and apprehend the suspect. When I pull a car over, do anything else police related, it's nice to know that I have a partner in the car who would give his life for me without even thinking about it. And that's the kind of partner K9 Wilder is, loyal and dedicated. Another one of the dog's primary uh, functions is that of evidence recovery. The dog is taught to recover any item with human scent. At evidence recovery, you bring the dog to a certain area, such as a field or a wooded area, and you ask the dog to recover any item with human scent. You do this by introducing him to the area and then telling him to fetch it up. That's the command for evidence recovery. One of the most common things that the canine is asked to find or recover are guns or weapons that are used in crimes. Boy, what a good boy. Another common call for the shepherds is to track humans. A lost child, an escaped fugitive. Makes no difference to the dog. To them, it's all a game. Boy. The shepherd's nose is far more sensitive than that of his handler. Carges illustrates Wilder's keen sense of smell by hiding a wristwatch for the dog to locate. I, I'm going to give Wilder the command to search for any human scent. He might find a Coke can. If there's a Coke can over there, I'll have to go inspect it and, and, then, and then redeploy him. So he's looking for anything with human scent on it. Heel. Heel. Stay. No. Catch it up. Catch it up. Catch up, what do you got? What do you got? Good boy! Good boy! Good boy! Wilder finds the watch within 30 seconds, demonstrating the tracking value of a well-trained ESU K-19 member. Ken and Wilder and myself were dispatched to assist Troop K with an evading motor vehicle accident. Apparently a drunk driver had struck two teenage girls, subsequently killing them. The drunk driver then crashed his van into the woods and fled on foot. We responded from Troop C to the town of Lebanon to assist in the track. The first thing I noticed on arrival was the intensity of the scene due to the tragedy that had taken place. I placed K-9 Wilder in harness and introduced him to the scent of the operator by pointing to the driver's seat, put his nose to the seat, and gave the dog the command to track, which is find him. Wilder and I then began a track through the woods, through very rough terrain, assisted by additional state police personnel. Wilder uh, was pulling very hard on the leash, and I knew he was on the track. Just by reading the dog, I knew the dog was tracking the operator of the vehicle. He was pulling very hard on the leash and whining and, and giving me all the indications that he was going to eventually find the operator. Good 
Knowing the nature of the call, the severe tragedy that it was, it was a very intense feeling of wanting to apprehend the suspect responsible. <laughs> out of the woods into a clearing and the dog began to pull into a residential area. Uh, the dog located the suspect lying face down in leaves and tall grass and identified the suspect by putting his nose to the suspect. Suspect was subsequently arrested by the additional state police personnel. Because the track was so intense and, and lasted approximately a half a mile, the dog was fatigued, I was fatigued, so when we went home that night, Wilder got several Scooby snacks and a job well done. When Wilder comes home, he's just the family pet, and he loves my wife, and my wife adores the dog. Likes my wife a lot better than me. Back at the ESU headquarters, Master Sergeant Danny Lewis responds to another bomb call. We got a call from the uh, post office in the city of Danbury of a suspicious package. They received the uh, package that was uh, either vibrating or beeping. Local police have already cordoned off the area when Lewis arrives. The canines go in first. The dogs did not indicate there was any explosives inside. The next thing that we did is uh, take an x-ray, which is really a radiograph of that uh, package. The x-rays show whether there are blasting caps or explosives in the suspicious package. Lewis will quickly know if there is cause for concern, since the processing takes only 40 seconds those little speakers like they have in the music cars and stuff. Yeah. Though the x-ray shows no sign of a live bomb, Lewis proceeds cautiously. Okay, thank you. Must be a child's clock or something. All primary colors, real big. Many times after the uh, initial investigation you'll find out that it was not in fact a, a live device or even a hoax device it may be a uh, package that would just met all the criteria to become suspicious for someone the real danger in in these is that they're very possibly could be a live device many people have been hurt uh, right now we have people working on the case against the Unabomber we've had people in Connecticut that were hurt as a result of uh, things coming through the mail so to, to actually go there and respond, you have to use the precautions that this could very possibly be a live device. ESU troopers need to be prepared for the worst of possibilities. Each call I answer is fraught with a host of unpredictable and often deadly challenges. To succeed, these teams require skill, determination, training, and an unbreakable trust between all team members, human and canine. Canine Wilder and I were assigned to assist with a residential burglary that was interrupted while in progress. A neighbor had come home and discovered that his neighbor's house was being burglarized by two people. And then when they were confronted by him, I got into a truck to try to escape. The truck got caught on a stone wall and the burglars were forced to flee into the woods on foot. When we arrived at the scene, the neighbor informed us of where he last saw the two go into the woods. I introduced the canine to the scent of the burglars from the truck 
and pointed to where I wanted the canine to scent from and put him in harness and gave him the command to track, which is find him. The canine put his nose to the ground and began to track in the location that the burglars were seen running. Uh, we then went into the woods and continued to track for approximately three miles. Uh, during the track, I was assisted by a trooper who ran the track with me and several perimeter cars. As we were tracking, I could tell that we were close to the suspects because of the dog's pull on the leash. He was pulling very intensely and whining, and by reading his body language, I knew that we were close. As we continued to track, and we knew the direction of travel of the suspects, I radioed ahead to the trooper who was at a perimeter, and uh, gave him the location and the direction of travel of the suspects. As we were nearing the end of the track, we actually caught sight of the suspects ahead of us, and were able to flush the suspects out into the waiting perimeter cars. The ESU's bomb squad holds a constant vigil. The most common explosive device they face, pipe bombs. Today, someone has found one where children play. ESU Trooper First Class Dave Bland takes the call. Okay, we just picked up a, a pipe bomb approximately uh, nine inches long uh, and about an inch and a half in diameter. It appears it's been there for quite a while. Well, it's got some corrosion on it, it's a little rusted, but it's also got a, a short wick sticking out of one end. Somebody must have drilled a hole into one of the end caps, uh, put the wick in there, lit the fuse, threw it into the river, didn't ignite on them. Because one thing with pipe bombs is, even though the powder is wet, once the powder dries out, it's just as dangerous as if it had never gotten wet at all. Preparation for the counter charge begins in a remote location. The powerful explosive C4 will be used to ensure that the pipe bomb is fully detonated. For this mission, Trooper Brundage will don the protective suit and handle the safe removal and transportation of the device. I like work winds. We can, have, we can run the wire behind the truck and up. Okay, when these guys come back out, we can pull up. Suiting up is a two-man operation, and it's critical that the bomb tech is correctly outfitted. Despite the layers of Kevlar armor, no suit is 100% bomb-proof. But, like the officer it protects, it's the best there is. Barehanded, Brundage retrieves the corroded pipe bomb and places it in the bomb transporter unit. The explosive is moved to a safe location where the men prepare to countercharge it, as they did with the ether. Brundage places the bomb, sets the counter charges, and clears away from the blast area. You see from the blast, and also the odor of, uh, the strong odor of sulfur smell, kind of indicates that the pipe was actually loaded with some sort of explosive powder, uh, whether it be uh, smokeless powder or, or uh, a black powder. Uh, right now we're gonna see if we can find any of the shrapnel from it. Uh, in comparison to uh, other known explosives, I'd say it'd be like a, uh, probably two hand grenades going off, because that was, that was a good size device. Most people, who die from explosives or die from bombings are killed by pipe bombs. Uh, we had an incident in California going back maybe 15 years ago where two California Los Angeles bomb technicians were handling a pipe bomb. The pipe bomb detonated and killed both officers. 
so pipe bombs are extremely dangerous. Every call must be treated as a life-threatening situation. Every package might have a hair trigger detonator. These men who face death every day rely on their partners for their very lives. As night falls, Carney and the ESU bomb squad enjoy some hard-earned downtime, but the K-9 unit is just hitting the streets. ESU troopers and their canines are posted at a roadblock. Their mission tonight, apprehend a wanted felon in a stolen car. So far, all is quiet and routine. Suddenly, a car blasts through the checkpoint. The chase is on. John was talking to him. He was getting him to pull over because he had no sort of identification on him. Uh, and the guy decided he was going to take off. So? Okay, we got the car. The suspect abandons the vehicle. Now it's up to the K-9s to track them down in the dark of night. Okay, we're going to do a track here off the car. See what we can find. Yes. Hey, buddy. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? We're going to start him off with a car seat, see what we can get. Come here, buddy. Find him. Answer them for me, John. Where is he, buddy? Is he back there? One canine is hot on the trail when he suddenly go. loses the track. Where is he? Well, the dog was on it for a little while, but then he lost it. Might have picked it back up again. Lost it again. And although the suspect got away, the ESU team recovers the stolen vehicle. When they discover that it's a different stolen vehicle, they return to the checkpoint to resume their watch for the wanted felon. Tracking is harder for the dogs in urban areas, where there are more scents and endless distractions. There are many factors during tracking that will affect the outcome. Some of these factors are uh, other animals in the area, um, human scent, a pavement, duration of time, all of these things can affect the outcome of a track. Uh, a track in the city is, is very difficult because of all the scents that the dog has to deal with and differentiate from the scent you're asking him to find with all the other scents. The roadblock has been in effect for over four hours. For the trooper and his dog, it looks like it's going to be a long night. That goes up into... Uh... Across town, is trooper first class Pat Achille and his partner of four years, canine Cato, search an abandoned mental facility for trespassers. Used to be one of the state's uh, mental facilities, and this is how they used to move patients and equipment in the winter time when the snow was, would make it inconvenient to move them above ground. This whole place is interconnected with these tunnels. When not on routine patrol, Achille and Cato serve on the elite ESU search and rescue team. Through floods, fires, missing person searches, and evidence recovery, Achille and Cato have shared many moments of tragedy and triumph. Being down in these tunnels reminds me of when we were down at the World Trade Center. The department was asked to assist the New York City uh, Port Authority police to search for the body of the uh, last victim of the uh, World Trade Center bombing. So went down with our search dogs and uh, stayed down there about about 10 days and helped them with our dogs. And uh, he was uh, right in the middle of the blast site where all the rubble had settled under the hole that went up into the plaza. Just to stand on the edge of that uh, giant crater and uh, look at the magnitude of that ball was. Uh, 
and it was pretty awesome. You know, ultimately we were successful, so we were glad to do it and be able to assist them in, in such an important thing. Back at the roadblock, right. troopers speed off after a suspect who fled while being questioned for suspicion of DWI. later, the car chase ends in a residential neighborhood. Kev, wait a second, Kev. Let the dog go first. Which way? Where? Again, the suspect abandons the car. Come on, buddy. Where'd he go? The troopers send the dogs in. Find him. And the track begins. That's it, buddy. That's it, buddy. Where is he? Get to work! Where is he? The search spills into a nearby park. Where is he, buddy? There's anybody in there? Come out or the dog's coming in. For Trooper Jim Codges, the experience is all too familiar. There is no such thing as a routine call. You hope for the best, but you prepare for the worst. You really don't know what you're going into. You just rely on your training and your experience to help you through it. That's a good boy. K9 Wilder and I tracked the operator of the vehicle from the driver's seat approximately a half mile through the woods to a residential area. Uh, the K9 located the operator uh, lying face down uh, trying to hide and elude police. Another ESU success owed to rigorous training and teamwork. Each dog undergoes a rigorous 14-week boot camp at the ESU's canine training facility. Sergeant Kevin Rodino is the head of the canine training program. The canine program in Connecticut is designed for instruction for local police officers, state police troopers. Um, we also have trained people from other countries. Um, and right now, probably in our program, we have, we're responsible for about 80 dogs every month that come back to us for various training. From a young age, canines are trained in the basics. You! Stay! <laughs> to this date, we've trained people from Egypt, Cyprus, Greece, and uh, Chile. Come! Stay! Sit! Down. It is critical that the dogs respond Stay. without question to their master's commands. Each dog is tested repeatedly to assure that only the best of the best make it through to graduation. Stay! Yep. 
Oh, you. Every day brings new lessons. Evidence recovery, tracking, man trailing, building search, obstacles, all emphasizing obedience. Heel. 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 Come on, boy. Hop. Over. Heel. Come on, boy. Hop. Over. Over. Come. Heel. It's a good feeling having a dog as a partner. It's someone that you can trust and count on and, uh, you work together all the time, so you're used to working with each other, and you know you can count on each other and what your limitations and capabilities are, and it's uh, excellent. Sometimes we're all forced to do things for our partners that we'd rather not. lesson the canine learns is when to break off of a suspect oh boy. Get him, get off. Oh boy. Drop the gun! Drop the gun! Stop moving, I'll break the dog! Get off! Break! Down! No break! Down! Watch him, boy. Step away from the door. Watch him. Speak, Anna. Speak. Watch him. Stay. Watch him. The scenario is repeated until the dog responds without a hitch. Come! Kill! Kill! Yeah, kill! 80% of the canine's job is performed with his nose, not his teeth. Oh, it's a boy. Good boy, it's a boy. When the day is done, these dedicated pooches enjoy time off with their families. We strive for what we refer to as a very socialized dog. They do go home with the families when they leave work for that day and go home with the family. They're designed and they're trained to be the family pet. To go in the home, they must live in the house. And that's pretty much what they are once they arrive at home when they're in their, quote, off-duty hours. A canine officer relies on his dog, just as each ESU officer relies on his partner. Their lives depend on it. The emergencies they tackle every day require total teamwork and commitment. These are the men of the ESU, Connecticut's Emergency Services Unit. From the bomb squad to the canine unit, the dive team, to the tactical and air support units. They serve with field-tested expertise, selfless valor, and nerves of steel.